Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining Myotonic's seventh in a series of Friday afternoon webinars. The Myotonic Dystrophy Foundation, known as Myotonic, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 2007 by families with DM seeking support and a cure. Our mission, what we call care and a cure, is to enhance the quality of life of people living with myotonic dystrophy and accelerate research focused on finding treatment and a cure. Our work focuses on support and education, research, and advocacy. Just a reminder of some of the resources and support opportunities that are available. We have a toolkits and publications page where we have lots of different resources available. Our virtual support groups and Facebook chats. Several new support groups and Facebook chats have been posted, so please go to the website to find out if there's one in your area or there's a general community one where you might want to participate. Our calendar of activities is up to date. You can access that on our website as well. And as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded and it will be added to our digital academy sometime this afternoon or early tomorrow morning. And as well as this presentation, you can find presentations and videos from past conferences, webinars, and events on our digital academy. A couple of new resources that have become available. The Employment Access Toolkit, which is a guide to navigating the employment process for people living with myotonic dystrophy. The toolkit helps individuals navigate the often difficult employment process and includes information on how myotonic dystrophy may affect your job, how to assess your readiness to work, hints on how to search and apply for a job, tips on how to write a resume or cover letter, ideas for interviewing, and much more. We also have a new health insurance considerations guide for people living with myotonic dystrophy, specifically in the United States. And this resource, resource guide helps you navigate the process of making sure your medical treatments and medications are covered, as well as to understand how to appeal your claim if it's denied. We hope the guide enables you to advocate for the delivery of healthcare services and treatments that enhance your quality of life and well being and that of all people living with myotonic dystrophy. A quick reminder about our family registry. You can increase understanding of myotonic dystrophy and improve lives of those living with DM by joining the myotonic dystrophy family registry. The family registry helps researchers find new effective treatments and identify possible participants for upcoming clinical trials and research studies and allows anyone who is registered to have access to the anonymous data. So this is any individual or family living with DM. The family registry gives all DM stakeholders from researchers and pharmaceutical partners and industry to fam family members a better understanding of the disease, the, D the DM community, and the current research and advocacy efforts. So you can check out the family registry and please do register if you haven't already. A reminder about this Friday afternoon webinar series. Every Friday at 12 Pacific, we have three more that are currently scheduled. On the fifth, exercise for the DM community. On June 12th, multi-systemic and cognitive aspects of DM2. And the 19th is myotonic dystrophy and the brain, causes, effects, and treatment. Our past webinars are also available on our Friday afternoon webinar series website. Next Friday at 12 is the exercise for the DM community presentation by Dr. Katie Eschinger and Tina Duong. Understanding the importance of exercise is vital for myotonic dystrophy care. And these two phenomenal physical therapists will present information on the benefits of exercise, the benefits exercise can have on DM, recommendations on aerobic activity, types of exercise, monitoring exercise, exercise strategies, and very importantly, finding motivation. Quick shout out for our gratitude project. If you haven't already posted, we highly encourage you. During this difficult time, we wanna find connection with one another and we're trying a My Gratitude project 
to get people to connect and to share with us what you or who, more importantly, you are grateful for. You can send in a photo to development at myatonic.org and we can put this beautiful little frame around it. Or you can just go ahead and post hashtag my gratitude. And we look forward to seeing all of your beautiful faces. There is a new virtual chair yoga series that starts next week. The amazing Ellen Shapiro has offered a four week gentle chair yoga series starting on Monday and the month, the three Mondays that follow at 12 o'clock Pacific. Um, you can find it on the mytonic.org slash chair dash yoga dash Ellen dash Shapiro. That webpage will give you more of the information about these four sessions. So on for today's webinar, Gene Editing for Myotonic Dystrophy. Today's speaker is Dr. Vincent Dion. If you want to ask questions of Dr. Dion, you can definitely type the questions into the chat box here and go to webinar. And if there is time at the end of the session, we will definitely ask Dr. Dion to answer those questions. And if we can't get to your question, hopefully Dr. Dion will have an opportunity to respond to you in an email after the session. So a little bit about Dr. Dion. He obtained his PhD from Baylor College of Medicine in Texas for defining the role of DNMT1, the maintenance DNA methyltransferase in preventing disease-causing CAG, CTG repeat expansions in 2007. He became a professor at the UK Dementia Research Institute at Cardiff University in January of 2019. And his lab has made key contributions toward the development of gene editing approaches to correct mutations that cause 14 different neurological, neuromuscular, and neurodegenerative diseases, including myotonic dystrophy. So if you have any questions or need help navigating during this session, please do go ahead and type into the chat box, or if you have other difficulty, feel free to reach our program director, Leah Hellerstein, Hellerstein during this program. Um, her email is here, and you can also text to her cell phone if you're having any difficulty. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Vincent Dion. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me the chance to be doing this. It's actually always really exciting uh, to do these kinds of events, especially uh, that uh, there seem to be a lot of enthusiasm for this. And uh, and I hope I won't disappoint. My goal is to actually convey some of that enthusiasm, uh, tell you about what it is uh, that gene editing could do, uh, including uh, the risks and the, the obstacles, because at the end, uh, I'm a scientist. This is how we this is how we think about things, uh, and also some of the peculiarities about myotonic dystrophy uh, in this field. And so, uh, we have some pre-submitted questions at the end as well that I'll start with answering before we we can get the the questions from the chat. But I think I hope we'll get as much time as possible. So, uh, just starting very uh, basically with uh, with gene editing. Uh, so gene editing, really, what it is, is deleting, inserting, or replacing genetic material. And so the really important thing about this is that what we're talking about is a permanent change. Uh, and so uh, this, is, uh, this would mean that you would have, a, uh, an, in an ideal world, uh, you would have a one-off administration of a drug that would lead to a correction uh, of uh, the genetic changes that uh, cause myotonic dystrophy, and you would be done for a lifetime. So this is a really tall order, and we're not there yet. Uh, but and this is what I want to uh, share: where we are now, and what where we what needs to be done. And so, just before we go any further, uh, there's there's often confusion between gene editing and gene therapy. And so, gene editing really, in the end, is a type of gene therapy where and gene therapy is broadly defined as uh, sort of using genes to treat diseases. So by that, I mean you could supplement you, uh, a gene so that would be uh, that would be lacking, for example, you would uh, 
put it in, or you would do gene editing where you would really edit the DNA of someone. And this is essentially what, we, what we're talking about here. So uh, typically what causes a disease is a mutation, uh, so a genetic disease that is, so it's a mutation. So a mutation is simply a change in, uh, in the DNA content. And, so, and that could produce a toxic product, for example. And so what we're trying to do with gene editing is to uh, mutate the mutation or inactivate the mutation to be able to correct it. Uh, and so, and, and therefore to remove this, this type of product that's there. So this is really what we're trying to do fundamentally. So these cartoons here is, is meant to represent DNA. Uh, and one, the only thing I want you to remember for about this is that uh, DNA is double stranded. So you have two strands here, uh, and this will become important later on. Um, okay, so how do we do this? Uh, fundamentally, it's not easy. There are a number of challenges, uh, specifically, there's how do you find the mutation in the DNA? So, uh, and uh, inside a cell, um, how do you correct that mutations once you've found it? Um, and how do you get a drug inside a cell so that all of this can happen? Um, and so we'll start with finding the mutation. So what I mean by this is that we've got, and not so much of, of in terms of sequencing, so we know what the mutation that causes myotonic dystrophy is, and so, uh, and we'll get back to that. Uh, and so this is once you're inside the cell, where in the DNA you need to, to correct, where, where do you actually get your hands on that mutation physically? So we have three, billions, uh, three billion base pairs of DNA per cell, and the mutation will be at one specific place in there. So it's really a needle in a haystack, a massive haystack. Um, and it's been historically, so people have been talking about doing gene editing and gene therapy for uh, decades. So in the 70s, there were reviews uh, written about this. Uh, so in scientific journals, so this is really not a, a new idea, but it's been a very much of a challenge to do this. Uh, and what's really revolutionized this recently is uh, the discovery of uh, a bacterial enzyme called CRISPR-Cas9. So CRISPR is the system as a whole. It's, it's coming from an from a immune system in bacteria, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, and uh, well, from a scientific point of view anyway, uh, I'm happy to talk about this, anybody interested. But uh, it is composed really of, uh, of two components. There's one that is this RNA here that will bind to your DNA uh, where you have your mutation. And, um, and the, the, what's really important about this is that this part here has a sequence that you can, you can program. You can put in any sequence you want to find a specific location in the, in the, in the DNA. And this is what uh, has really allowed us to do anything. Um, and the second function is that this protein here, this Cas9 protein is an enzyme that cuts DNA, both strands of the DNA, and it cuts it, and it creates an opportunity for putting in or, or uh, making changes in the DNA. So essentially the way it works is that you have uh, your mutation, the Cas9 using this guide RNA will find the site that, uh, where the mutation is, it will cut it, and then you will have some way of inactivating or repair. Uh, repairing that cut in a way that makes a mistake or where you could insert something else in that would inactivate or correct the mutation. And so um, this, is, this has come out in, uh, the, at the end of 2012, and this is already in, uh, in the clinic, in clinical trials. So it's been incredibly fast in how people have been able to use this uh, and adapt it for uh, therapeutic treatment. And so it solves really uh, two major problems of gene editing, finding the mutation and how and what you do with it afterwards and how you correct it. The third challenge is really how we get inside a cell. And here, uh, what we, the way we're doing it is by taking advantage of viruses. Um, because if there's one thing that viruses are really good at is to get inside our cells. And so we can uh, remove all the stuff that's inside the virus and put in um, only what we want to express, in our case, uh, Cas9, the Cas9 enzyme and the guide RNA. And so the kind of viruses that we use, of course, are not viruses that make us sick, or at least as much as possible. 
Um, so we're not going to be using COVID, for instance. We're going to be using uh, the one that's most promising right now uh, is an adeno-associated virus. So this is a virus that over 80% of, uh, of the human population is already infected with one of those. Um, and it doesn't make us sick. It infects the cells and gets inside and it hang, hangs out there without uh, really uh, doing much. And so it's an, ideal, uh, it's an ideal way, an ideal vector to get inside our cells and deliver what we want to deliver. Um, and so uh, this is still a challenge for a number of reasons, uh, which we'll get into uh, uh, later on. But then the question is whether this gene editing approach works at all. And so I just want to highlight two different, uh, one is a study that's been published. The, the second one is a clinical um, trial that's ongoing. So in, in this case here, uh, what happened is that there's uh, researchers down in Texas that have um, used this CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing approach to, uh, to treat uh, dogs that had a muscular dystrophy. Uh, so a very specific mutation uh, of muscular dystrophy. And so, and it looked like at least at the molecular level, um, it, it looked like it worked very, very well. Um, in one of the dogs, the, it, it, was, it was phenomenal. In others, not so much. Uh, but overall, it's a massive improvement over no treatment at all, right? which is really what we want. And it was, it was as far as they can tell, a sustained uh, improvement. Uh, that was at the end of 2018. A different a company doing completely different things have used the CRISPR uh, for the first time to for gene editing in people um, back in March. And so this was for a, um, a hereditary blindness uh, disorder called Leber's congenital amaurosis type 10. And uh, so this is ongoing. We don't know whether it works. We don't know anything about it right now. Um, so, but that's to say that the technique is already in, in the clinic. And so, which brings us to really, how do we apply this to myotonic dystrophy? And there's some challenges because uh, here that are specific to myotonic dystrophy. And that's, uh, because of the nature of the mutation that causes the disease, right? So um, usually uh, the most common mutations that cause diseases will be a point mutation. So you have one base pair that's changed, for example. Um, whereas in the case of myotonic dystrophy, what we have is a repetitive sequence of three base pairs, uh, in this case, CTG, uh, that repeats itself over and over uh, at one place uh, in the DNA. Um, and so unaffected individuals will have uh, two different copies of this gene with a short repeat track. And people that are affected will end up with an expansion of this, of this uh, repeat track, uh, in some cases going to thousands and thousands of these repeats uh, in the most severe cases. And so um, what, uh, what we want to do is to try to neutralize this, uh, but it comes with some problems. So what, First, because it's not a point mutation, what you need to do is have two uh, guide RNAs that would flank the mutation, flank the repeat. Uh, and then what you're hoping for is that you get this whole chunk here that will be cut out and excised. Um, and then that will leave you with removing the mutation altogether. So this has been tried uh, in cells. It's been tried in mouse models. Uh, and overall, it seems to work uh, at some, uh, with some uh, reasonable efficiency. Um, there's been uh, one group that's used a bit of a different approach where um, they took two guides as, as well, but then one, was, but a variant of this Cas9 enzyme that only nicks one of the two strands. So we get a bit of a different um, broken DNA. And then you, they, they put in, a, um, they, they could insert uh, another bit of DNA to sort of prevent this from, from uh, our mutation from doing anything bad. And they did this in part because what they found, along with other people, is that in some cases, when you have one cut here, um, you will have uh, 
further mutations that will occur. Some of them you'll have to repeat track. Some of them you will not, but it's going to be uncontrolled. Sometimes it will go uh, like this. So it will come out and pop back in in the other direction. And so uh, what we have essentially would be uh, many different events that we don't know whether they would correct anything or make things worse. And so this is worrisome. Um, and uh, there might be ways of getting around this, but some of this is thought to be because of, uh, at least some of, well, some of this is thought to be because of the, the presence of these repeats. Um, and so right now, uh, there's a number of, of risks, obstacles, and unknowns. So I told you that it's worked at least uh, partially uh, with some unknowns uh, in, in mouse models and in cells. Um, the two big things that I want to point out that uh, we'll need to really overcome is uh, the problem of, of targets. So this is when your Cas9 is not 100% efficient, and it will tend to not just find the needle that you're interested in in your haystack, but uh, a few pieces of hay at the same time and take that, those out as well. And so, and those might have very important functions uh, and so you end up with essentially mutating other places in uh, in your DNA. And that, of course, you can imagine that you can have a number of problems. So you could have potentially cancer or tissue damage. Uh, it's it's completely unknown right now what those might be and how and it will depend entirely on how common those off targets are. But uh, in um, the way it looks like right now. The question is not whether we'll find them or not. Uh, they will be there. There will be off targets that increase the risks. Um, the question uh, will be, and this is the kind of question that I think would benefit a lot from input from, from patients, is how much, uh, how much a risk, how, off, uh, how much of these off target mutations um, are we willing to consider to be, um, to, to not make it um, so bad as to not give the treatment, right? So is it better to have the myotonic dystrophy? Is it better to have the side effect that come with this, these mutations? Knowing that the mutations may not cause any problems um, right away, it could be years before, uh, before we have anything. So, so this is the kind of stuff I think that has a big component of ethics that I would be uh, really interested in hearing from, uh, from people in the community. The other sort of obstacle to overcome uh, is, is the problem of delivery. So I told you that we're using a virus that doesn't cause diseases. That sounds all great. Um, but uh, in the case of myotonic dystrophy, we have uh, multiple different tissues that are affected by the disease. So it's not just a heart problem. It's not just uh, a myotonic problem. There, there is a number of uh, it's multi-systemic, essentially. And so what that means is that you need to be able to balance the amount of virus that you would, uh, that you would administer uh, with, to have an efficient treatment and the potential immunological responses that will come with having a big load of viruses that come up all at once. Um, and so there are some ways of doing this for immunosuppressants, for example, uh, and I think, and, and the other way that's classically being, uh, being used is to have uh, instead of having, uh, instead of hitting as many cells as possible, you would focus it to one organ, for instance. Obviously, you see this that the second option, the problem would be that you might uh, treat one aspect of myotonic dystrophy, but not the other ones. And so those are really sort of the, the issues with gene editing that we have at the moment that we'll need to overcome. Um, and loads, loads of people are working on this. I'm, I'm not the only one, that's for sure. And so, but what we've done is um, try to take a bit of a different approach uh, to try to get around some of the some of the problems with um, with the approach. Uh, whether it's going to take care of everything or not, I don't know. But specifically, this idea of rearrangements around and mutations around the repeat track, uh, we seem to be in the clear for that. And so, the difference is what we what we're doing is we're targeting specifically the. Our, our repeat track rather than going with the flanking sequences. And we're cutting, uh, we're just nicking gently uh, within the repeat. And that reduces this nicking instead of cutting both strands of the DNA, reduces the number of mutations that are 
uh, that occur elsewhere and they simplify the process. And we think we end up with uh, a repair that leads to a contraction of these repeats down to a non-pathogenic level. Uh, this works really well in, in cells right now, uh, as you can see here. So this is uh, the only scientific slide that I'm gonna be showing you because I think it's really exciting. Uh, this is blood cells from, uh, individual, from one individual with maritime dystrophy where we uh, put in a virus expressing our Cas9 and our guide RNA. Uh, this here at the top is uh, the, uh, the pathogenic allele. It has 1,600 repeats in this case. And this at the bottom here is the non-pathogenic allele with five repeats. You can see that within five days, we've lost this, this pathogenic allele. We started making it smaller. And by 30 days, 29 days, um, essentially all we have left with is this, uh, is this repeat is this non-pathogenic allele. So uh, this is, uh, I can't tell you how excited I am about this, but there are two, there are major problems. Uh, one is that this is in cells, in blood cells. It's not in, a, a, in culture in a dish. And when you try to move from a dish to a human, uh, that is, uh, it's not clear how well it's gonna translate, but we're hoping for the best. And so right now we're being funded uh, by uh, Myotonic through uh, very generous funders, um, and they and what we're doing with uh, with that uh, with that grant that research grant is to ask two different questions. One is whether uh, our approach works in a mouse model for DM1 in collaboration with people in Quebec City and in Paris, and the other is to find out exactly how much of these off-target off mutations there might be with this approach compared to other ones. Uh, and so we're hoping that uh, we might have some answers for that um, by uh, within about a year from now. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll keep you posted once, the, <laughs> once this is all done. Um, so this is really what I wanted to give you as background. We have now half an hour left, and uh, there's been some questions that were submitted ahead of time. So I've gone through them once, uh, so I didn't want to read them uh, too deeply and, and so that not to lose the sort of the, the interaction that we usually have for, for presentations like this. Hmm. So bear with me if the answers are not completely clear, and please continue asking afterwards. So one question was, is there a possibility that the gene could be edited in vitro? So by that, I uh, think what the person means is that uh, you would do it in, uh, in a cell. You would, you would take a cell from, a, from someone, correct uh, the mutation, and then put it back in. Um, so the answer is yes, there are people working on this. Um, uh, how efficient it's gonna turn out to be is unclear. Uh, whether uh, and, and I think one of the big questions is how many cells you would need to, to be corrected, present, functional in your tissue um, for this to work. Uh, I think, um, but, but definitely it's not, I, I sound negative. Um, so I think ultimately we need a lot of different approaches to see what will work. And this is one of them. Uh, and we don't know because I can't predict the future, which one will work, right? And so, yes, uh, in short, yes, this is a possibility. Uh, regarding the application of gene editing as an alternative to IVF and PGD, so IVF is in vitro fertilization, PGD is a prenatal genetic diagnosis, could gene editing be done to an affected fetus? So I think there are two, two things I wanna say about this. One is gene editing would not be an alternative to IVF and PGD. Um, and uh, it would be uh, to treat uh, most likely just adults, although it would be theoretically possible to affect fetuses. Uh, but, and this is related to, the, to another question later, so I'm just gonna address this now. Um, what we're trying to do is gene editing in what is called a somatic cell. So a somatic cell is a cell that's not passed down to the progeny. And the reason for this is, um, is that uh, is the, the, the problem that we have of, uh, of these off-targets that are unknown. 
And we don't want to be in a situation where we're modifying human genetic material that's passed down for not only this one person, but all of their kids and their kids' kids and, and et cetera uh, for, forever. And so uh, we're trying to keep um, away from what we call the germlines. So those are the cells that are passed down, uh, including an early fetus, for instance. Um, and so you would not probably not want to do this. Uh, in fact, uh, you've heard of CRISPR babies. Um, so this was done very poorly by a researcher in uh, China. He's right now in jail for having done that without proper ethical uh, um, uh, uh, approvals. And so uh, I think this is a, we can talk about this more if you're interested, but this is really, um, we're really just focusing on uh, presumably adults or, um, or maybe kids eventually. Um, but yeah. Uh, if a woman affected with DM1 has successful gene editing, do her eggs still carry the affected gene and therefore can still pass it to her children? The answer is yes. Um, so we would be, um, we would not be editing in the eggs. Um, and I think just to add to this conversation, but to this, to this issue is um, we would have to also make sure that we're careful uh, not to do it accidentally, uh, to have gene editing in the germline in an accidental way. And so there's a number of safety concerns that are there. But the answer is yes. Um, she could still be passing it on to her children. With myotonic dystrophy, you may have to hit many different tissues, including skeletal, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscles, plus CNS, so that's the central nervous system tissues. Uh, one of the big challenges with gene editing is delivery. Uh, you agree. What are the most promising delivery technologies out there? And they may be able to deliver a single product to three muscle types. Yeah, so, so the, um, the AAVs are, um, are sort of um, opportunist, opportunistic mainly in how they infect, um, uh, they infect cells. So cardiac muscles are relatively good. Skeletal muscle are relatively good. Smooth muscles are a bit more difficult. Uh, the CNS is feasible. Um, and so the answer is yes. Uh, the problem is the quantity that you would need to deliver and the route of delivery that will need to work to be worked out. Um, what I think, uh, if, we're, if one of us, uh, one of the labs working on this is successful in moving forward, what we'll end up doing most likely is one of these uh, at a time, uh, at least for the first, uh, the first drug is likely to be targeting only one uh, tissue, I would imagine, uh, but that's me speculating. Uh, what would gene editing target in myotonic dystrophy? Would it just target the toxic RNA or would repairs to the DNA be made? So in this case, uh, in, in what I've been telling you about, we're talking about a permanent change to the DNA. So we would be hopefully removing the underlying mutation that causes the disease. There are other groups that are working on removing the toxic RNA. Uh, and uh, that I, I'm also using some of the Cas9 um, technology, a modified Cas9 technology. Uh, I'm going to choose not to go into this, but uh, uh, but again, I think we need to have multiple different approaches uh, for doing this, uh, for one to one to come out on top and be a viable treatment option. Since the expansions vary from patient to patient and even from cell to cell, how would a drug recognize the correct number of repeats to cut out? So I think there, uh, so the, the two ways that I've shown you, one is by using, by forgetting about the repeats altogether and cutting in the flanking sequences. And the way we're approaching this is to cut within the repeat track. And it turns out from our work in cells that only the ones that are, uh, only the, the alleles that have at least um, about 60 or so repeats, uh, are targeted for contractions. And I have some ideas to, at the molecular level as to how that would work. I think uh, you, 
they're at this point speculative and you probably don't want me to bore you with, uh, with DNA structures and that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm happy to answer emails about it anytime and talk about it all night. Um, but uh, okay, so this is the questions that were submitted. We still have uh, quite a bit of time, which is good. And so, and I'm not sure how we do this. Um, so Dr. Of, yeah, I can ask you the questions now. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for your presentation. We have some great questions that have come in. Um, so first question is, would gene editing help someone who has already who already has symptoms, or is it a solution for someone with who already has a diagnosis? Yeah. So uh, so first, I have to say that the questions that are being submitted are are incredible. <laughs> they're they're uh, they're all spot on. Um, so so this is uh, both. I would imagine. Um, so you would have, but. I think the expectations would be very different. So I think in the case of someone who doesn't yet have uh, symptoms, um, what you would what you would expect is probably uh, at least at the beginning uh, delay the uh, the onset of the disease as much as possible. For someone who already has it, the goal would be quite different. It would be to stop the progression uh, and dare I hope uh, reverse some of it. Uh, but this is, uh, we don't know whether the disease is reversible at all at this point uh, in people. There's one mouse that seems to be, one mouse model that seems to be um, reversible. So that would be good news. But uh, how that jumps from a mouse model to a human model is, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, speculation there. And Many times it doesn't, right? So, you know, often it does, but many times it doesn't. So we don't know. Okay, thank you so much. Another question that came in, how do we ensure that only the strand with the repeats is cut and not the quote unquote healthy one? Yeah, so I think what will happen um, is that the, the uh, non-pathogenic one will be cut, but a nick is, uh, is not very, um, it's something that's very easy to repair in an error-free manner. Uh, so what that means is that you might cut it uh, and then reseal it and you're done moving on. But if you have a long repeat, you'll have multiple landing sites for the Cas9 enzyme. You'll cut at multiple places along the repeat. And the, more, the longer it is, the more cut you're going to get. And that will be one of the, one of the reasons why you would preferentially target um, a, a pathogenic allele, not a non-pathogenic allele. At least that's what it seems to be in our cell system at the moment. And for, oh, sorry. And for the ones where we have, um, we're cutting outside of the repeat track, of course, uh, we, right now, uh, you have two choices. Either you don't discriminate and you cut both, and you hope that uh, this sequence doesn't have a normal uh, function that not a normal function, but a, a, a function in keeping the cells healthy. Um, or you're designing the guides so they're very precisely target only one of the two alleles because they're not completely identical. The trick, though, is that if you do that, um, not everybody, uh, not all people will have the same changes. And therefore, you'll have to do this uh, for every. Uh, every what are called SNPs. I'm trying to find a different way of of saying it for the for the non uh, non initiated. Um, so there are changes. So mutations in the DNA that don't have any deleterious effect that are present all over the all over the place. And then what you would need to do is find one of those uh, that is different between the normal uh, or the not the normal the non pathogenic and the pathogenic alleles. And uh, from there design a guide RNA that would be specific for one, but not the other. Uh, and so you would decrease the number of people where that particular drug would be applicable to. Um, and you would, also, um, uh, you would also increase the time and the money that it takes to get that drug uh, to these people. And so this is one of the reasons why I think um, our approach has an advantage there, uh, should it work. 
Great. Thank you so much. There are a variety of questions that have come in around DM2. If you're able <laughs> to you please speak to what research has been done around gene editing in DM2 and if what you've discussed so far is applicable to DM2. So, uh, so what I've discussed so far that's applicable to DM2 would be cutting outside the repeats uh, so that you could do. Uh, we don't know whether it would work for DM2 inside the repeat because the repeat is a uh, is a tetranucleotide rather than a trinucleotide. And so we've not tried that. Uh, so I can't tell you whether it would work or not. We'd be interested in trying that, um, but, uh, but we haven't yet. Okay. Um, in cells that are su successfully edited, does the repair end when the cell dies or are you targeting tissue stem cells? So you, uh, so you're, you're, the cell hopefully doesn't die um, and stays and simply the DNA is being corrected. Um, so you would, uh, you could, you wouldn't have to only target the stem cells. You could also target uh, differentiated muscles, for example, or neurons, if it works there as well. Um, so this is one of the unknowns at the moment, whether we, we could do this. So I'm, so, um, for our approach, for everybody else's approach to cutting outside of the repeat, that has been tried in, in multiple different uh, tissues and it seems to work. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, but you wouldn't have to target just the stem cells. Okay, and this might be a tough question, but can you, can you speak to the timeline approximately when we might have a worldwide solution and or <laughs> the timeline for human use? Are we talking how many years yeah. here? Um, so I, uh, I'm reluctant to be on the record to do this. Um, what I'll say as a cop out is that uh, CRISPR has been, um, has been coming from uh, very basic research on bacteria that in a field that was rather obscure to the clinic in eight years. Um, and so, um, you could imagine that the same amount of time to have something as a clinical trial is not completely crazy, but that is, has a lot of assumptions in that. Um, and that is, for instance, a, if it works in people, if it works in, in animals models, if we have a, a benefit, if we can, you know, the efficiency is high enough. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ifs and buts here that could really set back uh, the field, uh, if we don't do it properly by, by many, many years. I mean, gene therapy famously has been set back, uh, 20 years for, um, an unexpected, uh, death early on for one of, one of the first, I think it was the first patient for adenoviruses. And so, you know, we have to be, uh, I understand there's a, there's, you know, a need for, uh, for a therapy now, uh, and I can't, unfortunately, promise it uh, that we even have one. Uh, what we're doing now is, is try to see if this is all feasible and whether it's worth pursuing. And of course, you know, I'm optimistic. I, I want to think that this is possible. Um, and if I sound a little bit careful, uh, it's because I'm sort of painfully aware of everywhere where it could uh, potentially be a roadblock. Um, and so, but certainly we'll be hoping to... Uh, to get around those roadblocks as much as possible. Thank you so yeah. much. Great. <laughs> <That was> a, <laughs> yeah. Um, a question, two questions that came in around the, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, the case gene yeah. editing. Um, one mm -hmm. question, does the case gen, gene editing require cell division? And does the contraction by case also happen in muscle cells? Yeah, so both of these questions, uh, I think, um, so we've not we've not published anything yet. I think the answer is yes, but I can't um, be completely positive on it. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, if it doesn't work in cells that are not dividing like your muscles and your neurons, then it limits greatly um, the applicability of of the approach. When you're cutting out the the repeats on on both sides, then you then that that works in non-dividing cells, and so. Based on this and 
and other data. We think I'm, I'm cautiously, uh, cautiously optimistic that this is indeed the case. Okay, thank you. And one last question. Is there any indication about how long the flanking piece could be, i.e., can the same pair of Cas9 guides be used for everyone affected with myotonic dystrophy? So, yeah. So this is, so for our approach with the Nikkei's, you would use the same one for everybody. In fact, you would use the same one for other diseases as well. Um, and so it seems to be independent of where you're, you're cutting in the genome. For, um, for uh, the when you when you're cutting outside of the repeat, then there um, we don't actually know whether we need the sequences. We need the repeat for anything, right? So, um, so it may be that we don't, and if we don't, that's great because then we can use the same guides for for everybody. Um, if we if the repeat is useful for something, it keeps it keeps ourselves healthy for other reasons, um, and that would be why it's there in the first place. Then, um, then we're in a situation where we uh, we um, then we're in a situation where we can't apply the same guide RNA for everybody because then you would have downstream consequences that are unintended. Uh, I have to say. Um, that so one of the one of the worry I have is that for for all of these diseases that are caused by repeats, including myotonic dystrophy, is that the typical study time um, would be would be very short compared to the lifetime uh, and the progression of the disease, right? So um, so any long term consequences will not be picked up early on; they will be picked up very late. Um, and uh, it might be worth it, uh, but we won't actually know uh, probably until we try. Uh, and, and that's gonna keep me up at night for sure, because uh, we don't wanna harm people, uh, is the, I guess is the Google don't be evil thing, right? I mean, um, so yeah. So again, I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic. Uh, Okay, thank you. And one more. I spoke too soon. We've had a few more. Yeah. Um, thank no, you, everybody, great. for your great questions, by the way, if you have any yeah. more with them um, right now. But one last one that came in was, what will the off target look like? Will this cut other CTG slash CAT repeat locus? Uh, so, so the answer is yes. Uh, it will nick other, uh, other places in the genome, uh, in, the, in the DNA of cells. Um, and uh, we, the, the mutations can look like changes in repeat sizes. It could look like um, point mutations, and it could look like uh, rearrangements that I've shown you. Uh, all of these are potential, uh, are, are uh, not impossible. So some of them are more challenging to detect than others. Uh, where, right now trying to set up comparisons between I think four different methods um, to try to capture as many of those as possible. Um, I think that's really that's that, that really this uh, this issue of off target mutations really occupies a big chunk of my brain. How do we get at it? How do we potentially prevent them if they're too if they're too frequent? Um, and we just don't have the answers yet. Um, so yeah. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna give one more minute for people to submit any other questions. Yeah. Remember yeah, to you, them through the yeah, chat making, box. Yeah, sure. those questions have been making me squirm. It's, it's really good. <laughs> yeah, they're great questions. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Through the chat box and uh, we'll give it about one more minute. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, maybe I, the two small things Maybe I just monologue for two minutes just for people to, uh, to send more questions. One of which is uh, how much the, the COVID situation is slowing us down. Um, and so we were talking about this just before the, the webinar started. And the answer to that is, uh, 
we're about to reopen. So the lab has been closed now for about two months. We're about to reopen uh, with social distancing in place and all the rest of it. And so we're hoping that a two months delay is not going to be too bad. We had some uh, bioinformatics that we could do remotely. So uh, if the social distancing doesn't work well and we have to close again, then it's going to become much more problematic. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. But right now, I think this has been relatively minimal. Uh, so that's one. Um, and then the other thing I, I always want to tell people is, is Cas9 was completely basic research with no, uh, no vision towards, um, towards therapy of anything. Nobody woke up one morning and said, I am going to use this enzyme for gene therapy. Okay. Um, so this is coming from really people doing really basic research. And so I think it's important to keep in mind that when we're dealing with translational research like we're doing here, where we're trying to bring things from the lab uh, to, to the clinic, uh, that what we're bringing to the clinic had to be done early and not necessarily with a view uh, towards, uh, toward, towards treatment. So basic research is important to fund because we don't know what's going to be useful to translate later on. OK, thank you. Um, a few more. Uh, what percentage of cells that have NICase will have contraction? Uh, so, um, so this is a matter of time. Uh, so we've done in our system, we've done all the way down to a month, uh, and by a month, uh, we have the majority of the cells that have uh, a contraction uh, down to a normal, uh, a normal or non petrogenic uh, size. So yeah, it's it's fairly impressive, but it's in dividing cells in a dish. So there's a there's a mountain to climb. Right. Okay. What have you learned, if anything, about similarities to the off target of the mutation? So we don't we so we haven't been uh, so we haven't we haven't found mutations yet. Uh, that's not to say that we've looked hard enough. So. Uh, so I can't tell you what the mutations look like. I can only tell you what they may look like. Um, and uh, but so the the preliminary results that we have is that the the off-target mutation frequency is less than about uh, is less than a percent. But we don't know how far down it is, right? So there's a big big difference between having an off-target frequent mutation frequency of one percent versus an off-target frequent mutation frequency of one in uh, in a hundred thousand, say. Uh, and and that is the difference between going ahead with a clinical trial and not. Um, and so I think this is what's really important in in finding out how much there is, what kind there is, where where they are, because um, that's going to really determine whether it's safe enough to move forward. In addition to all the you know the delivery, the efficiency, and all the rest of it, I think the off-target is a big uh, go no go point. Great. And last but not least, where can we find out more information about your lab, your research, and any other information that's coming up on this topic? Yeah. So um, I'm. I think I'm on. Uh, I'll just move up to my first slide. I should have put that uh, here. So I'm at uh, the UK Dementia Research Institute at Cardiff University, and you can find me on Twitter over here. Uh, and you can email me uh, questions or anything. Um, and I can tell you and squirm and that I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, or maybe I, I know and I can give you a useful answer, but uh, you'd be lucky. As you could tell by all the answers that I said, I don't know. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Dion, and thank you to all of our participants for your great questions. This is a really great, engaging session. Again, thank you, Dr. Yon. I know it's late for you on your side of the world. So we really appreciate your time and your attention to this really important topic. And just to remind everybody, we'll be posting the recording of this session this afternoon on our website, and you should also receive an email with the recording. So thanks everybody for your time and hope we have a good hope you have a good rest of your Friday. Take care.
It's a pleasure. Thank you.